Hope you had a great coffee break. And if, for those of you who've seen the pavilion, uh, I have not yet. I'm really excited to see it. Um, so I am, I guess, by training a physicist, but um, I grew up, my mom does textile art, so I have been knitting and sewing and everything since I was a little kid. And then when I got to be an adult and start my own lab, I've been trying to merge both of those into uh, my own sort of research program. So I'm gonna maybe make this um, as non-technical as I can, um, but uh, I've also totally redesigned it as of like two days ago because I had a project last week that turned out well, so I wanted to add that in. Um, so, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, forgive me if it's a little incoherent. So these are the members and visitors from my lab. So we have a very diverse set of students. Um, most of them are physicists, but we also have mathematicians and engineers. Um, being at a tech school, we don't have that many local design folks, but I try to collaborate with them as much as possible. Um, so my lab, uh, we're not, we do some computation, but I just wanted to say that like our, our motto, I guess, is, is knitting is coding. Um, and so we think of this in a whole bunch of different ways. So one way we think about this is all of these little symbols uh, code for a topologically distinct uh, manipulation of yarn and needles. So you can think about it uh, from a, a language point of view um, as sort of a grammar. Um, one thing that got me interested in this particular piece is um, this, I'm, this is called The Dragon of Happiness. It's by Sharon Winsauer. Um, and this is something I made when I was in grad school. And I had been knitting for a long time at that point, And I was, I really liked making lace at the time. That was like the thing I was into. And I was pretty used to like everyone uses the same sort of motifs over and over again in different combinations. And that's how you generate a lot of these structures. But this particular piece was really quite interesting to me because it had a, a stitch I had never seen before. And there's um, these sort of stripes in the dragon, the flame coming out of the dragon's head. And there's also some in his beard. Um, and that was something that got me interested in this from a, a mathematical point of view. So what, what can you knit? What, what possible ASCII symbols can you put in here to generate a language for knitting? And thinking about textiles from a computation point isn't anything new. So this is um, a Jacquard loom, which was invented in, I think, 1804. And this is um, one of uh, the real drivers of uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, which is where textiles sort of took off as one of the most sort of ubiquitous um, materials that we use all the time. Um, and this, uh, this is for weaving, not quite for, for knitting. But uh, the way this works is that uh, weaving has um, two directions of yarn. So there's one direction, I'm going to say, up and down. This is called the, the warp direction. And then there's a weft direction where you uh, weave in and out um, the strands. And the way it usually works is um, there's a mechanical thing that lifts a whole bunch of them up together and you pass yarn under it and you put it down and sort of swap the directions of this and you get um, plain weave fabric. And the way jacquard loom works is it runs on punch cards and it's basically individually addressing every set of crossings you can have in the entire uh, textile. So each of these threads is basically taking each crossing and saying, you're up, you're down. Um, and so this is, this is really a digital computation technique and it inspired um, a lot of the uh, sort of uh, Lovelace and Babbage era mechanical computers. Those also uh, ran with punch cards as did computers up until the invention of the transistor. Um, these are still used today. This is 
a modern one that's printing out fabric that has a picture of someone's face on it. Um, and here, of course, this is running with many, many different colors of yarn at once. So we are interested in taking this beyond a, a binary language of overcrossings and undercrossings and trying to understand what, uh, different, what different stitches you can have, what they do uh, from a sort of computational point of view, but also what they do from a mechanical point of view. So I guess I'm gonna take another little segue and say uh, a big part of this network is thinking about the environmental impact of this. And I can't talk about textiles without saying um, these are just terrible for the environment. Um, there's, I guess I don't remember these statistics, so I'm gonna have to read them to you, but there's, I guess, 95 million tons of actual waste every year. So discarded clothes, things like that. The fast fashion industry is something that contributes to this. Um, and it uses 97 trillion liters of water annually, releases 1.2 billion tons of CO2. This is combined with manufacturing, shipping, um, uh, all, all sorts of everything that goes into textiles is causing a huge uh, CO2 uh, production. And um, it also generates uh, 200,000 to 500,000 tons of microplastics per year. Um, and to see where the microplastics come from, um, textiles are made up of these very hierarchical materials. So you start with fibers, whether they are synthetic fibers, plant-based fibers, animal-based fibers. They start with fibers that are usually fairly short in, in length, um, maybe like 10 centimeters, say. Um, and those get spun together into these long filaments and then here's, I guess, four filaments together which have been twisted around each other to make a single uh, piece of yarn or thread. And then everything we wear is made up of these combined hierarchically into uh, flat sheets which are then cut up and sewn together. Um, and this is this, this Hierarchical texture is why these are nearly impossible to recycle and uh, why they contribute to huge amounts of pollution every year. So each of these staple fibers, every time you run your, your clothes through the laundry, they come out, uh, they get sort of sucked into the wastewater system, out into the oceans, and then we eat them as part of uh, being apex members of the food chain. Um, also because of this structure, um, disassembly is very hard. So because they're so hierarchical, even if you were to take a knit and unknit it, you still end up with these fibers. And these fibers are usually blends of many different, I think this says, yeah, these are blends um, of many different uh, types of material, often acrylic, polyester, cotton, silk, wool, all of these things get mixed together. And so if you wanted to recycle them, it's, you, you cannot separate those out. There's a few people in chemical engineering who have found um, microbes that can digest certain plastics or, or things like that to, to help with this prob problem. But this is, this is a, a really big problem with the textiles industry. So I'm not gonna present any solutions, but I'll, I just need to acknowledge that this is um, a big issue. So I guess we're interested in, in knitting. Um, and in particular, this is, uh, I, I, I grew up as a hand knitter. We do have an industrial knitting machine in the lab, but, and the, the language is slightly different between hand knitting and machine knitting. And for those of you who are machine knitters, I apologize, I use hand knitting language. Uh, so just, just, just to let you know. So for, Basically for hand knitting, you have um, two needles, so a right needle and a left needle, and you have a bunch of loops on those needles. And to take a stitch, you take the right needle and put it through the first loop on the left needle. Then you take this working yarn and you wrap it around the right needle 
and you pull it through the loop on the left needle and then you slide the loop off of the left needle. So you've basically made a loop through a loop and passed it to a different needle. And so all of knitting is just taking loops and pulling them through loops fundamentally. So this is um, what these stitches might look like. These are uh, from, these are paths from simulations. This is the physical thing, and this is just a computer render of what this might look like. Um, and this is the, the material I showed you just now. Um, I call it stockinette. As a hand knitter, you might have known it as jersey um, if you are a sewer or a, um, or a machine knitter. Um, and this material has two sides to it. So it has a front side. And if I rotate it 180 degrees, I have the, like through the center line right here, I end up with this structure over here. And if I look at a stitch, uh, this is what it looks like on the front. And this is what it looks like on the back. And the stitch on the back, I call a purl stitch. So knits and purls, same thing, just whichever side of the fabric you look at them from. And this is, a, this is some material that's made from it. Um, it's really stiff, um, shockingly stiff compared with the other fabrics. Um, I'll, I'll pass these around in just a minute. Um, and this you'll also see curls up. So that's not exactly relevant now, but it'll become relevant a little bit later. Uh, and so this fabric is, um, this is ubiquitous. This is the most common fabric. Everyone in this room is wearing something made out of this fabric. This is, uh, my shoes are knitted. They're made from that. Um, everyone's sweaters, everyone's t-shirts, socks, underwear, pretty much everything that you're wearing, a lot of it comes from this. Um, if I combine these in different orientations, I get really different types of materials with different types of behavior. So here I've uh, alternated rows of knits and purls, and this is a fabric called garter. So this is the orange one, and this is quite stretchy in this direction, and it's much stretchier than uh, stockinette horizontally, but, but you'll really notice the difference between stretching in the, the vertical direction. Um, the middle one is one by one rib, which is instead of rows, these are alternating columns of knits and purls. Um, and so that one I have here, and this is maybe an order of magnitude softer than, than the stockinette. And this is used for, for cuffs and collars in a lot of commercial knits. Um, and the last one is a checkerboard lattice, and it behaves quite similarly to garter um, as a hand knit. It, it's a little bit different on a machine. So I'll pass these around. Um, and so the reason for the difference in behavior is basically the symmetry of how the stitches work because we know that every knit stitch is the same as a purl stitch. And so I'm showing you these from an angle. Um, so this is like the end on. So the blue things here are the, the stitches. There's, there's three stitches. And then this is the yarn that joins them together. So if I have two knits next to each other, I have to have something symmetric connecting them. And so we just did a sort of back of the envelope calculation where we um, basically take the material and stretch it just a little bit. And so we're looking at extending this length here. We started with some length lambda naught and we extend it by lambda and we end up with um, some energy that's 180 times a bunch of other junk. And you can ignore the junk, um, but the 180 is the important part. Uh, and then if we do this for um, something that alternates between uh, purl stitches and knit stitches, uh, we end up with one other parameter and that's this angle here. So the angle from the end of the piece, the yarn segment to uh, the, the front of it. And we do the same extension here and do the same energy measurement and we find that it's 12 times a whole bunch of other junk. Um, and so this, just looking at the relative size between 180 and 12, this is 15 fold smaller. 
it can be modulated by this thing that depends on angle. So if this is vertical, this term is zero. Um, so there's no additional contribution. And what's going on here is you basically just have this free rotation angle. Um, when it's zero, then it's parallel along here. Um, and we've made our yarn unstretchable. So it costs infinite energy to stretch something that you can't stretch. Um, so basically by comparing uh, the actual shape of these from our simulations, uh, we can pretty well work out what the different elasticity is going to be. Um, so we can use this to assemble it into a bunch of different structures. So this is um, a glove that was designed to be somewhat therapeutic. It's supposed to like support the bones in your wrist, um, but leave the rest of your hands free to, to move. Um, and so uh, we designed it based on how stiff the, st the stockinette region is going to be, and then put the other regions in just to show the orientations that is most stretchy. So these green ones, they're stretchiest in this direction. The orange ones are stretchiest in this direction. And the purple one is pretty much equivalently stretchy in each direction. So we want to be able to bend our knuckles and our wrists freely. The thumb needs to be able to move in all directions. Um, and then the wrist is trying to be held in alignment. We can also take advantage of the fact that the uh, stockinette, the blue one, curls up to make all sorts of different geometries. So this is, um, so these are, uh, I guess, stockinette in, uh, in white and then reverse stockinette in yellow for this one. Um, this one is uh, something flat. I think this is, oh, I think this might be rib or garter. Then there's stockinette regions in blue and then garter in the middle and then it continues out. Um, and then these are some origami patterns. Uh, this one is commercially made. Uh, this is a uh, Isaniake sweater. And this is one that we, not exactly the same pattern, but similar from our machine. Um, and so the idea for this is that we can create a lot of these structures without the need to use blended fibers. So um, blended fibers are something that they would use in industry to create all of these different mechanical responses. So uh, one of the referee reports came back and was like, well, why don't you use elastin? That's what people use in the medical industry. Um, and we, we didn't make it clear, but uh, what we would like to do is say that, okay, we can take something that's, that's cotton or wool or something that's biodegradable, something made from trees, something like that, um, and get the same range of elasticities by changing the pattern. Um, gosh, I'm running out of time and I have not even gotten to, <laughs> there's like four projects I was gonna talk about, so I better talk really fast. So, so these are um, made from, these, the idea of uh, the patterns I showed you uh, come from uh, this, this biomimetic project. So it turns out that elephant trunks, they have um, wrinkle, or I guess folds up here and wrinkles down here. And it turns out that the geometry of the skin actually supports the mechanical motion of the trunk. Um, and so that's uh, Andrew Schultz's uh, PhD project. And so he was interested to see if we could uh, copy basically how the collagen is aligned in the different types of skin to make um, sort of knitted biomimetic structures. So here we are copying the wrinkle pattern um, and over here we're copying the, the fold pattern. Um, and so this is, I think I'm gonna skip this, but I guess the, the, the punchline of this is one of my students who had never knit before becoming uh, my PhD student, because you don't usually go to physics PhD school to learn to knit. Um, uh, he was playing around with like mathematical properties of knits and came up with um, his own stitch. So this is 
uh, he calls it the cow hitch stitch, and there, there are six of them here, but he basically looked at the mathematical properties of it and was able to come up with his own stitch from there, which is amazing. Um, also someone who had never knit changed knitting history by, by using math, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, so I guess this is a little bit on, this is our industrial knitting machine. Um, this is actually the sort of machine that manufactures the clothes that we wear. Um, and this is it um, in its former life that was making these generative textiles. Um, and so we came up with a uh, basically um, a formal definition of what knitting means mathematically, but it also means that uh, if you run it in the reverse order, all knits can be unraveled, which I think is maybe colloquial, but it's kind of funny that we can prove it mathematically. Um, so the idea is that we can we haven't quite gotten funding for this yet, but um, if we can hook up these ball winders to something that has like computer vision and some motors, we can use those to uh, disassemble uh, existing textiles. So this is something hopefully we'll get to work on in the future. Um, so this is, I guess, project two. This is what happened last week that um, made me change all of my slides. Uh, so we were uh, filming a whole bunch of uh, videos. We have a project on uh, virtual reality for curved spaces. And so we were looking for some like B-roll uh, for some of them. So I had sewn a couple of surfaces. Uh, and so this surface, uh, or this structure here, this is um, the, this is um, Asher's uh, Circle Limit 4, which is also called Angels and Demons. Um, and this is supposed to be on what's called the hyperbolic plane. So what you wanna do is imagine that each of these angels or demons is all the same size and shape as each other. Um, and so this is gonna get really, really, really wrinkly, just like um, the hydrogels that Iran showed us um, in the last talk. Um, and so we're gonna look at this particular model of it because this happened to be one of the models from our virtual reality thing. Um, and instead of looking at just the models, we wanted to play around with, um, I think I can skip this slide because I think Iran introduced us very well to curvature. <laughs> um, uh, uh, make um, make uh, like physical models of it. So you can really see how roughly it is and see how easy to move it is. And, um, so uh, this is a blanket that I made for, for the project a long time ago. But uh, one of the things we wanted to show is that you can take these small patches of it and uh, glue them up to make other structures. So this is um, a torus that has multiple holes in it. So that is this guy right here. Um, and so if I unzip it, um, you'll see this is part of a hyperbolic plane. So I guess pretty much everything I'm gonna be talking about from now on is how do you take flat pieces of fabric or structures and fold them up to make curved surfaces in a bunch of different ways. Um, let's see. So I will pass this and the other one around. I will ask though that you you be a bit careful when you're zipping them up because I kind of made up my own zipper stop. So basically the zipper part comes off if you zip them too fast. Uh, so. so I have, I guess, video. This is, uh, or I guess this is the, the, the picture of that one for those of you who weren't in the front of the audience. Um, and I do have some video of me sewing or folding it and zipping it up. Uh, so this is basically these curvy squares and then I can take um, every other side and fold it into the center um, and then these ones get zipped up um, and then it's going to take me a while to, I, I couldn't figure out how to speed up the video in the uh, software so this is going to take a little while 
But basically, you see there's like these holes um, on each side. So mathematically, we call this a pair of pants decomposition because it looks like a pair of pants. Um, and so I'm going to sew this part or zipper this part to this part, the dark red to the light red, the yellow to the light blue. Um, and then that folds up the structure here. Um, this is another one. Um, and this is one that folds up into the same type of surface. Um, I have it here, so I will try to do the live zippering faster than that video is going to run. Um, it might not work though, because zippers are quite fiddly. Um, but this one, uh, if only I could talk while doing something that requires this much concentration live. Um, So I guess I got two zippers done, um, and here's the I guess real life is uh, nowhere near as fast as the video. Um, all right, and then one last one. See, <laughs> so be careful zipping them up. Um, sorry, yes, go on. Yeah, this is. Yeah, this is the um, Euler characteristic uh, demonstration. So we're playing around with uh, those geometries. Um, I guess this is a similar thing. This is um, about adding, taking flat things and adding curvature to them. And so what? we're gonna do a zoom in. Um, so we have an angle alpha on one side and an angle beta on the other side, and these should add up to 360 degrees. If I make one of them a little bigger, um, this gives us something that's slightly hyperbolic. So what we can do is take these seams and bend them. So take a whole bunch of different angle and like every interval of the surface, bend it just a little bit, so we get um, two different shaped seams, and these are, I guess, the same length, so we can actually sew them together. Um, and so this is one of the patterns we had. Um, oops. Uh, and so this is joint work with uh, Lewis Campbell and Kelly Delp, and Lewis did uh, all of the sewing, who an, was an undergrad in my lab and now is a grad student um, in the School of Textiles at Cornell. Um, and so basically, this is how he joined them together. And here's an example with the pattern I showed you. And then here's an example with a pattern where we put them at slightly different angles. Um, and so the idea here was to, instead of um, sort of engineering things to have curvature at points, we want to put all of the curvature into the seams. Um, so this is very curved fabric, but or garments, but made with flat pieces. Um, and this is uh, something that was inspired by uh, work that was done at EPFL with Pedro Reis and uh, Mark Tapali is somewhere in the audience. Um, so they had done these triaxial weaves kind of from a material science point of view, and I was interested in them from a fashion point of view. So I really wanted to make a jacket out of it. So this, this is just a prototype showing that uh, we could basically do the things that they worked out on a simple surface. But this is what I wanted to do. So I have like a, a model of my body. Um, and so I made strips that look straight on my body, but they're not straight actually. So when I unroll them into the plane, I get these sort of weird wiggly wrinkly shapes. Um, I can weave them together like this and to not uh, allow them to uh, bend freely, I put rivets in. Um, so, so this is it being assembled and then me wearing it um, at the end. Um, 
And so this is the, the last project I will talk about in I guess the last maybe five minutes. Um, uh, so this is uh, Macham Alchemy, was a group of 24 uh, artists and mathematicians that came together to make this uh, enormous room-sized installation. There's a, a real human for uh, perspective. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit about this lighthouse construction here. And uh, this is joint work with Emily Baker and Edmund Harris. And this was inspired by um, a, a project that they did called Zipform. Um, so this is uh, the sculpture that they made. This is at the University of Arkansas uh, in Fayetteville. This is um, a real sculpture that um, I guess is I think 12 feet tall to use um, in imperial units. Um, I, I guess maybe close to a little bit less than four meters. Um, and so this is all steel that's been welded together. Um, and, and Emily Baker is an architect um, and Edmund's a mathematician, just so this is kind of a fun uh, interdisciplinary project. Um, and so the idea is that when you have a sheet of steel, this is all just regular, I guess, 12 gauge steel, I think. Uh, I think one of them was 12 and one, uh, one of them is 18, but I can't remember which, which sculptures were which. Um, you can bend it uh, quite easily, um, but you cannot twist it. Um, so in the curvature language that um, Aran showed us, this is um, mean curvature. I can bend it, but I haven't changed any distances within my surface. The metric is the same. And this is uh, Gaussian curvature where I've changed the distances. Um, and so this is something that steel does not want to do. Bending it is pretty easy. Um, and so the whole construction basically is based on this idea I take sheets of steel and I bend them around another sheet of steel and then weld them in a T intersection here. Um, and so this is what one of the panels looks like. So instead of curving just one, like I showed you in that animation, we wanna curve both of them at the same time. Um, and so this is the, the jig that they built um, that lets you curve both sides um, independently. So the vertical one can curve this way and then the bottom one can sort of curve up and down um, and then you sort of uh, uh, spot weld it and then move it a little bit and spot weld it and move it a little bit. Um, and that's how this structure works. So mathematically, this means we want to have no torsion. Um, and so torsion is, you, this is the, the tangent to the curve um, and then there's a, some frame around it. And uh, torsion happens when that frame rotates around the tangent direction. So here it is again as a surface. So, so that twist right there and this twist here, those are all signs of places where you have torsion. Um, and so what we wanna do is get rid of all of the torsion. Um, and we can do that with this thing that's called the parallel transport frame, which basically you just subtract all the torsion off of it, but this is, um, a pretty cool frame because, forgive the uh, animation um, uh, problems right there, uh, because you have freedom to rotate it. Um, so these would all be distinct pieces of steel if we were to make this as a sculpture, but uh, there's a lot of freedom in what these curves actually are. Um, and here's an animation that shows uh, four different sculptures and how they would move if they were allowed to, to do this as individual things. The main idea is that we'll take an interesting curve and then make a, a large sculpture by uh, animating, or by taking each of the frames of the animation and making an individual sculpture to go with it. Um, and so when we made the lighthouse, we wanted to do this for a surface and not just a curve. So all of that freedom you had for a curve, you lose when you get a surface. Um, and so you have only these specific sets of curves. So here I've drawn them in um, uh, green and blue. And so 
animate it going through a series of deformations. Uh, the goal for this was to make a lighthouse, so we wanted a spiral going up so that the animals in our scene could walk up to the top. So I've made it interesting by wiggling it, but I haven't done anything to allow this to spiral. So now I'm going to add some spirals in by, um, by sort of taking the whole surface and giving it a twist. And I twist it just until these are a nice... Uh, slope for the animals to walk up and then this is this is the the surface we get from it and we do exactly the same thing as before these are the what the sheets of steel are they get plasma cut out these aren't packed very well there's a huge amount of waste but you could in principle do a much better job than i just did in a cad program um, and we tested it in paper first and then this is uh, one of emily's students uh, welding the actual piece together. Um, so, uh, and here's here's an, another in progress piece being welded, and then this is what it looks like at the end. Um, I liked it enough that I got it tattooed on my back. Um, so, I guess that's that's the last thing I have to say. And uh, this this QR code should actually scan. It sends you to our lab, but. Um, Thank you, and thanks for bearing with me through some of the... This, this one? Yeah, exactly. So if you, is, it, is, it right that you, is it right that you you only really pick what to do at one end and then the, everything goes all along and completes the entire thing? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, you just pick like the right. starting right. angle, yeah, the rotation, and then everything is uh, yeah, just generated from there. That's a great question. Uh, I will say I don't really know anything about the embodied process. I mean, as a knitter, I also can knit without looking. So I think it's a thing that you do after, you know, thousands of hours of doing this. Um, it's like you can do it all by touch. Um, uh, just to comment on the how things move forward, this is not the same question, but the mathematical definition we had is like basically exists because of how I like to fix mistakes. I don't like to undo everything. I like to sort of fix them locally. So it turns out that how I fix them as a knitter is what gave us the mathem mathematics to do that description. So I think there's a huge like range of taking the experience of people who are knitters in, in industry and all of like who are actually dealing with the material from like a kinesthetic point of view and then using that to shape science. Um, I Maybe the going backwards is a little bit harder because mostly it just ends up with us trying to automate away things that people <laughs> have done forever. Um, but I, I, think, I think there's a lot of room for that conversation to happen. Last two questions, Mike and then you can. Uh, yeah, and thanks for the great talk. Um, so, what I find fascinating is you know, you take a one dimensional material that is sort of then turned into a two dimensional structure with some systems and varying um, kinds of properties. Is there a generalization of machine at this point, like making volumetric things? Uh, 
that's an interesting question. So there are definitely 3D weaves. That's a, a big thing. 3D knits exist sort of. It, like there's people, there are papers of people who have done 3D knits and there's some pretty interesting like layered knitting work. I think there was, I think I read an article in the newspaper about someone who found some, you know, baron of something from, you know, a couple hundred years ago who had these really interesting knitted samples that like no one since had used that construction. So that was also a, a like a multi-layered structure. I don't think there is machines that do it, but someone else might know more than me. Um, I don't think as a machine, because I think it would be pretty hard to do that. Yeah, that's. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think. Yeah, there, there's definitely tubular machines, and there's some really interesting machines that are like have an X shape to them that can knit like whole garments at once, which is a really, really interesting. Yeah, the Shimoseki. Yeah, those are really cool. I, I would love to be able to buy one, but it's like so expensive. So expensive. Um, well, so it started with like the, the really big like um, hyperbolic plane structure and then this was like the, the scaled down one. Um, so scaling it up, do you mean like from the, from the fabric point of view or from like, a, like to an architectural, like a different materials point of view? More fabric, uh, like because now we're already talking about mandrel weaves, mm -hmm. which is how the things that are actually the weave that they have we haven't yet this is from like last week so <laughs> this is like super super new but that's a great idea i think that i would love to hear more about your idea and think about maybe ways of implementing it so yeah 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 no i'd love to hear more this is we this is just like super brand new we haven't thought about really anything except the one um implementation for that one video so <laughs> Yes, I already Maybe we can close by thanking Sapeta once again.